This meeting is now being recorded. Good day and welcome to From Harm to Health, centering racial equity and lived experience in mental health crisis response. As you will notice, all participants have been muted. If you have a question to ask, please submit your question into the Q&A window, the icon which can be found at the lo located at the bottom of your screen. Your questions will be answered during the Q&A panel. If you have any technical issues, please send a chat to all panelists, the directions of which you can find in the chat window. Thank you for joining. Please welcome Davida Kilgore, MSW, Fountain House member, artist, advocate, and retired therapist. Please excuse the interruption. Davida, will you be able to unmute yourself? Perfect. The front end, a choreo poem. One, dialing, send. 911 operator, what is your emergency? There is a crisis, my neighbor Isis, mercy me. Where is this Isis? She lives on my floor next door. What is your name? Karen Flame, where do you live? Down the lane, what's your number? 7586210, what is her name again? Isis, she's in crisis, don't hang up, help is on the way, two. Heard through the roar when the police stormed the door. I am Isis, originally obscure, a goddess without a tongue until temples were consecrated in my name. Revered among the greatest gods and goddesses. I raised the dead, healed the sick. I am a role model for all women. See my beauty in my sheath dress hieroglyphic sign of a throne covering my breast. I come back from hell with a story to tell, saying in my right mind, my pain may not look like yours, it's mine, criminalized while you scream in agony. Our wailing words sound just the same. Three, Isis, I will reprise Deborah Danner 66 year old black sister who lived with mental illness, schizophrenia, killed. Sorry. Killed by police in her own home, her own home in 2016, killed in the cuddle of a mental health crisis called in by a neighbor. I reign supreme and even now I have experience of independent living. Poets and artists have to live longer than life before. It's a huge step either way to the future or the past. No, no time to look back. My head is on sideways. Creating art keeps me sane. Deborah created art, didn't stop bullets from entering her body trajectory life ending hers too soon for no reason other than dis-ease, damn. Four, there is no shame here. No stigma must be applied to the vulnerable and marginalized. Those who have been maligned, despised, scandalized, who we realize need only human security to be treated with humanity, ISIS. The perception of me as a stranger, as a danger to a stranger, lacking a knife or a gun, society feels I will pick up a brick and hit it in the head or run naked screaming through the streets, pulling out my hair, singing gibberish, but not fearing the man, the clan, throwing bombs at your store, witnessing for more white power, touting their own brand of white supremacy. Why can't you hear my testimony? Is it any more profound than this? I am a vulnerable to attack than they when just yesterday I was walking down the street after leaving the very center of my black neighborhood 
and was profiled by misogynists who didn't want me and didn't want me to live my life in peace as ISIS, not in a crisis, but in a state of recovery. He knocked over my cart and my food spilled out onto the ground. Bruised fruit, smashed melons, commodities collected for me and my babies. But we are always feared, we children of a darker hue, singing black and blue in this land of the free, just not to be me. Five, Isis. Don't forget the women in this song. When I will all night long at their plight, their flight into the deepest recesses of their mind. They too stand on the front lines and march and sing and chant and make signs. I rally my troops who testify before local city and state officials, beneficial to getting our stories told. I speak for those without voices, for those unsure of the strength of their vocal cords, for those afraid to peek out of the shadows for fear of reprisals from those who don't understand that a diagnosis is not a person any more than a mother-in-law's tongue is an African violet. Six, Isis. And so I am Isis, not in a crisis, but reprising the dead, healing the sick with magic. I sing my song of wronged women and men, my kin, misdiagnosed, mistreated, sometimes defeated in this game called life. If we are to have racial equity, then we as a society must plant the seeds of democracy in everyone's front yards where they can grow, giving shade and sustenance. The governance of how 911 calls are sent out to social workers and peer specialist teams with the clout to answer cries of distress with the best answers to the questions raised. What we call the front end where it all begins. It starts with Black Lives Matter. Thank you so much, Davida, for your powerful poem that reminds us of why we're here today and recalls the memory of one of the lives taken all too soon from all of us, Fountain House member Deborah Danner. Good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Ashwin Vastan. I'm the president and CEO of Fountain House, and I'm so pleased to host this virtual event tonight and to share the Zoom stage with so many colleagues, collaborators, and supporters. If you want to follow us on Twitter, by the way, we're using the hashtag from harm to health. For those not familiar with us, Fountain House is a national nonprofit fighting to improve health, increase opportunity, and to reduce social and economic isolation for people living with serious mental illness. We've been at it for more than 70 years, along with more than 200 programs in nearly 40 states that we've inspired, modeled after Fountain House. All told, we work with more than 60,000 people around the country. Drawing on this network, we're leading a national movement for the dignity and the rights of people living with serious mental illness. I come to this work, not as a mental health professional per se, but rather as a primary care and a public health doctor and an epidemiologist. And that's why I'm leading Fountain House, it, because it requires public health solutions grounded in prevention, evidence, access and equity. I also come to this as a family member who has had, who has loved ones who live with and have lost their lives to severe mental illness. While our relative social and economic privilege in my family may have shielded us from the most violent effects of our failing health, social and law enforcement systems, we too were impacted by the dysfunction, the disarray, and the scarcity of resources in our mental health system. Changing how we respond to mental health emergencies, often referred to by systems as crises, is the subject of our recent report, From Harm to Health. And this response is part of what requires transformative public health solutions, and what we're here to discuss tonight. So let me set the stage a bit. We're in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic. We are perhaps for the first time, confronting our collective mental health. Trauma, economic insecurity, social isolation, and loss have afflicted all of us, but some more than others. COVID has brought into stark relief the scale of the mental health challenge that awaits us, 
We're already in the second pandemic of mental illness whose long tail we will be experiencing for years after the last case of coronavirus is diagnosed. But it has also exposed the inadequacy of our systems and our responses to mental health issues to meet this challenge. COVID has also once again lifted the lid on our original sin in America, the systematic and racist marginalization and disenfranchisement of black and brown people. Not only are black Americans more likely to be diagnosed, to be hospitalized and to die from COVID, they are disproportionately facing the impact of the pandemic on their social and economic stability and on their mental health. And there's a renewed cry for justice and fairness in policing. We come here tonight in the midst of the Derek Chauvin trial following the murder of George Floyd. And just this weekend, another tragedy, the needless death of Dante Wright in a routine traffic stop. Mental health is inextricably entangled in this. The sad truth is that our largest mental health treatment facilities are our jails and our prisons and mental health crisis is the front door to that system, the front end of that system. There is a toxic intersection of racism, of law enforcement and mental illness. And we must confront our continued, rely continued reliance on punishment and criminalization to address what are in their essence health issues. Nowhere are these intersecting systems failures more apparent than in our approach to addressing mental health emergencies. Instead of marshalling health, mental health and social support resources to reach out to people in a moment of great need, when they are often the most afraid, we deploy our public safety and our enforcement apparatus, which pulls people in to repeated cycles of punishment and institutionalization. Tragically, too often this results in the needless loss of life, as you will hear throughout the evening. In fact, one in four deaths at the hands of the police are people in a mental health emergency. And these people are disproportionately black and brown. We know this in a deeply personal way at Fountain House, as you heard in DeVita's powerful poem. In 2016, Deborah Danner, a vital and shining member of our community, a 66-year-old woman living with schizophrenia was killed by the NYPD in her home in the Bronx while in the midst of a mental health crisis. The ripple effects of this tragedy continue to be felt today. And it's for this reason we call this project the front end. In many ways, mental health emergency response represents the entryway to a punitive system of mental health treatment that neither meets the health needs of the person nor makes us safer as a society. The human and economic costs of this system are far reaching. As we face the second pandemic of mental illness that we've been thrust into due to COVID, we must have a serious national conversation about mental health, a conversation about how we can build systems grounded in public health in human security and in dignity that can make our society an easier place to live for more people and especially those most stigmatized and most at risk. By focusing on the moment of crisis, a foundationally different approach rooted in health instead of punishment can catalyze change across the mental health system. The front end project in our resulting report adds a critical dimension to important work being done to better our crisis response systems already, including the work being done in communities around the upcoming 988 suicide prevention mental health crisis hotline number. The front end project centers race equity and lived experience of mental illness in establishing an aspirational North Star for crisis response one that's rooted in public health, in dignity, and not in public safety. And from that North Star, it distills a set of principles and accompanying strategies that will contribute to the work being done in reform of crisis response. The work around 988, combined with recent momentum and new stimulus aid for mental health, the first significant new, health, new mental health money in years, represents an opportunity to think both narrowly and broadly in our focus on mental health crises. How reforming our response to crisis will not only save lives in the moment, but it can unlock a downstream set of changes to our health and mental health systems that focuses on prevention, on recovery, and access to high quality and equitable care and community supports. 
The report is intended to serve as a conversation starter, not only narrowly about mental health crisis, but as an entry point to a broader conversation around reforming our mental health system and focusing on public health and upstream social determinants of mental health. This report and what we discussed tonight is meant to be used by a range of stakeholders from federal policymakers to community leaders. Our public sector partners can use the North Star principles as a filter through which to examine existing crisis reform efforts and funding or to launch new efforts. Our community partners can use these principles as a guidepost for their local conversations around crisis to ensure that a representative group of stakeholders are around the table, addressing the core issues that intersect with race and the experiences of people living with mental illness as a part of local efforts to transform mental health emergency response. I'm glad to see so many representatives of different stakeholder groups and sectors in our audience tonight. Together, we can build on active efforts to center race equity in the work of the new presidential administration, as well as commitment to addressing police reform and transformation of our criminal legal system. We must seize this opportunity, this moment of opportunity to incorporate the intersection of these systems with mental illness in a way that draws on the traditional mental health stakeholders who have historically led crisis response and treatment efforts, but also broadens the conversation to other sectors. At the community level, we hope to engage in continued dialogue centering racial equity and lived experience and building off of an incredibly active, but unfortunately siloed community efforts in criminal justice reform and mental health crisis response in cities, counties, and states around the country in a way that brings these related conversations together. So before I close, I'd like to thank a number of people. First, we, we wouldn't be here today without the tireless work of our partners, the 60 participants in our focus groups, and our supporters. I specifically want to shout out Ken Zimmerman, Karis Jan Myrick, and Margot cronin Furman of the Mental Health Strategic Impact Initiative, S2I, Chaka Barrows of the W. Haywood Burns Institute, Julian Adler and Raquel Delerme of the Center for Court Innovation, Francine Ariente and Kevin Martone at the Technical Assistance Collaborative, and Mary Crowley, Ruvi Paramal, and the entire Fountain House team. We're exceedingly grateful to David Rogers and the Ford Foundation for supporting this project. And of course, I have to thank Fountain House and our Clubhouse partners around the country and each and every person with lived experience who trusted us to listen to and share their stories, to remember some of their most challenging moments and to see the power that those individual stories have to turn into collective action. Tonight, we have gathered to bring this report to life and to discuss how we can move from words on a page to screen or screen to action in our communities. You already have a sense of what we have in store for you based on DeVita's powerful opening. Unfortunately, Patrice Cullors intended to join us tonight to further emphasize how mental health reform and Black Lives Matter are movements that intersect. I'm sorry to share the news that we just learned in the last hour that due to unforeseen circumstances, she's unable to join us. Following my remarks, veteran philanthropist Ken Zimmerman will talk about how and why he has turned his energies to mental health reform. And we'll conclude with a panel moderated by veteran broadcast journalist Cindy Rodriguez, who will introduce five panelists who played a key part in the front end project. So now I'd like to introduce Ken Zimmerman, longtime philanthropist, former head of US programs at the Open Society Foundations, former housing official in the Obama and Clinton administrations, civil rights lawyer and social justice champion, and now co-director of the Mental Health Strategic Impact Initiative S2I, and a key partner in this project to discuss how to resource social justice change, like reforming the narrative around and support for those living with serious mental illness. Over to you, Ken. Thanks, Ashwin. And uh, even more, thank you all who are joining us here this evening. I wanna talk personally about why this report and more centrally, the issues underlying it offer two significant opportunities. First, it's an opportunity to see, really see an issue of deep injustice long hidden in plain sight. The mental health challenges that have gone unaddressed by so many in this country. And second, to recognize this moment as an unprecedented one to start down the road of transformational change in mental health. 
As Ashwin kindly suggested, I'm a civil rights lawyer with decades of experience in a variety of settings, including around housing and homelessness and criminal justice reform. And especially in those fields, as I operated at various levels of philanthropy of the federal and state governments and the like, I always was aware of the intersection between those issues and mental health, but it was always a bridge too far. It was too complicated, too challenging. And if I were to be honest, too scary. This changed when my oldest child, Jared, developed a serious mental health condition when he was in high school. Over the course of the next four hellish years, we, just, we sought to support him from every possible angle and in every possible way we could using the significant privilege that we had in terms of resources, expertise, and the like. He died as a direct result of his mental illness five years ago this week. So this issue is not just one that I see as something that's important professionally and in terms of public policy, even though that is true, it's something that's deeply personal to me. I mention this not because our experience was exceptional, but actually the opposite, because it was not and is not. You've heard from Ashwin and we'll hear more about how many people and families struggle with mental health challenges and how dramatically this has been exacerbated by COVID. And you've heard and we'll hear even more about how black and brown people suffer disproportionately given how mental health and especially mental health and substance use disorder emergency responses sit in the intersection between multiple systems that are just beginning to grapple with the consequences of institutional racism. Tonight, before I turn you over to a tremendous panel and before I ask you to join us in the effort to make real change, I wanna make three straightforward points. First, and especially for those of you not familiar with the mental health arena as I was not, there is a real set of seedlings of change, of opportunities for forward progress. For decades, people with lived experience, their families, providers, and others were at the forefront of arguing against stigma and marginalization of people with mental health conditions. In the past couple of years, though, they have been joined, especially by young people, seeking to stand up and speak out against the marginalization of people with an illness, with a condition. And this has actually started to shift the public narrative. We're seeing NBA stars, celebrities, political leaders, and others start to connect the dots between other forms of othering and marginalization, whether it involves race, whether it involves LGBTQ rights, whether it involves other people who have been pushed to the sidelines and connected those forms of structural inequity to what is beginning to occur in the mental health world. And that is reflected, frankly, slowly, but nonetheless surely in the public sector. Recognized, for example, in the American Rescue Plan's $4 billion worth of investment in mental health supports. And beyond that, we're even beginning to see it in the business community, finally starting to grapple with the ways that insurance coverage has not fully lived up to the parity provisions that they are required to a reflection that this is not only the right thing to do to advance human dignity and to advance the interests of individuals who are part of their workforce, but the economically smart thing to do to attract people and retain them as part of their workforce. In fact, this reminds me of the criminal justice reform movement 20 years ago at a time when the conversation was about super predators and the war on drugs, brave leaders stood up and recognized that there was the possibility of making transformational change with dedicated effort that recognized the inequities and looked for opportunities where it was possible to connect the dots 
to actually see where those inequities could align and be addressed in a comprehensive and significant way. And while as recent events of the past days and months make clear, we have ample space and room to go to address the ongoing consequences of mass incarceration, we are on a path to do that. And I'd like to suggest this report suggests that the ambition and potential for transformation in mental health can actually be something similar to what we've engaged with, with criminal justice reform. Second, as this report reflects part of the significance about mental health crisis reform as an issue is that it lies at the intersection of multiple disparate systems and fields. And therefore, while the issue is critically important in its own right, our own personal experience trying to support Jared in the midst of crises he experienced make this something very palpable to me. It is also notable that by addressing this issue, as the report suggests, one can make real change in police reform, emergency dispatch, how communities can provide supports to people with mental health challenges in their communities, how we can actually recreate a system of care that is public health oriented and end the default use of police, jails, and emergency departments for people in need. In fact, the response to mental health emergency response across the country in over 500 communities that are starting to try to take steps to end the criminalization of mental health. In the federal government's uh, provision of up to a billion dollars over the next 10 years of Medicaid reforms to provide public health oriented services, all reflect an opportunity to seize that can actually make the difference in people's lives and equally significantly start to transform systems that are ready and desirous of that kind of change. In fact, one of the most remarkable aspects of this moment is the desire for change is reflected in the many people who participated in the front end discussion groups. It's reflected in public sector leaders. It's reflected in members of police agencies themselves who recognize that they are not set up, nor are they the best ones to respond to the kinds of needs that are identified here. And finally, and I wanna be very explicit about this, while there are many conversations about mental health emergency response going on, one of the report's most significant contributions is the idea of making racial justice central to this conversation and ensuring that the voices of people with lived experience are not only heard, but recognized as central to the kind of changes that are needed. If I can speak for a moment to my philanthropic colleagues, part of the excitement I feel about this report and the work that will flow from it is that it is taking up many of the insights that one has seen in other fields from criminal justice reform to housing advocacy to racial justice in the workforce and starting to see those connections that collectively can be brought together and ultimately lead to large scale change. I still serve on the Lippman Commission in New York City, which four years ago was established to help spearhead the closure of Rikers Island, the notorious jail in New York City that tragically is one of the largest institutions housing people with mental illness in the country. At that time, and especially for those philanthropists who were involved, it was something that actually took deliberate, patient, complicated steps toward trying to bring about a long overdue change. What is most striking for the philanthropists in the audience here today is the opportunity that exists now is one in which the potential for change is far more obvious, far more capable of being acted upon, and far more at the hands of those who are on the front lines, as I think this report makes clear. So let me close 
by saying that especially after a year such as this nation has experienced, the long overdue reckoning with the original sin of racism in this country, the loss of life that has unfortunately occurred at a level that is beyond what I think any of us could have imagined, that I have come to believe that one of the great gifts we can give to those who have suffered is an orientation toward hope and the ability to make real change. In its essence, that's what this report reflects. An outline, a framework, a belief that by doing the kinds of things that Ashwin outlined and the panel will turn to, there is the potential to make transformative change, not just incremental change. And I am deeply grateful and appreciative of the team that was involved in all of this, and even more to all of you for joining with us here this evening and hopefully joining us in the future in the journey that this report outlines. So thank you, good evening, and I'm ex very excited to hear the panel with the rest of you. Ashwin, back to you. Thanks so much, Ken, uh, for your remarks and your call to action for each of us. I think Ken just did a beautiful job of really outlining that wherever your starting point is, whatever sector you represent, uh, whatever stakeholder you consider yourself, there is an opportunity now to make mental health a kitchen table issue, mental health reform a kitchen table issue in the same way that our economy and schools and, and our justice system is a kitchen table issue in our public life. And it's gonna take all of us working together to do that. So thank you, Ken, for capturing that. Um, I'm now gonna welcome Cindy Rodriguez, incoming senior editor at Reveal, to introduce and moderate our panel featuring a cross section of front end project participants. Over to you, Cindy. Thank you, Dr. Vassan. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you for inviting me to moderate this panel. Um, the goal of this panel is to bring to life the report from harm to health, which is centering race equity and the lived experience in, in how we respond to mental health crises. Um, all of the panelists here tonight were part of this report. Um, I'm not going to give you their full bios. I'm going to give you very brief bios, but you can find their full bios on the website, which I believe is on the chat. Um, at the end of our discussion, there'll be time for questions. So um, I believe there's a way for, for the audience to submit questions. Uh, so with that, I'm just going to go ahead and get started. So our first panelist is Dr. Rochelle Brackney. She's Chief of Police for Charlottesville, Virginia. Our next panelist is Karis Jan Myrick. She's Co-Director of Mental Health Strategic Impact Initiative, also known as S2I. We also have Dr. Stephanie Lamel, Director of Public Psychiatry Education at Columbia University. We have Christina Sparak, a certified public accountant, a Fountain House member, a mental health advocate, and a peer support person. We also have Will Snowden, New Orleans director of the Vera Institute of Justice. Welcome everybody. And let's start things out with Dr. Lamel. So Dr. Lamel, this entire process is, has been called the front end project, uh, partly because this is about transforming the front end of the mental health system and, and sort of analyzing how emergencies develop into crises in the first place. So tell us what the front end of the system looks like right now. What, if, if I am a black or brown person living in, in Mott Haven in the Bronx and I'm having a mental health crisis and I need help, what am I going to encounter? Well, unfortunately, um, if you're in New York and, in your, and you're in the Bronx, the, the, the go-to response when someone is in a crisis is to call 911. And the New York City mandate is that the police are the first ones to respond and EMS also will respond. Um, and I think that part of the difficulty um, that we're having right now in New York is that we don't have a spectrum of responses, right? There's one response, 911's called, the police show up, EMS shows up, and then a decision has to be made. 
Is this a person who needs an emergency room level of care? Is this an emergency? Or is this the spectrum of a crisis where the person might benefit from just having someone to talk to? Um, where the person might benefit from speaking to a social worker or a peer or someone else who might be able to help them think through the difficulties that they're having. Is this someone who has substance use um, mixed in with mental health and they need a safe place to detox or maybe get involved in rehab? So there's a whole spectrum of, of um, needs that people have when they call 911, but our default is 911 and the emergency room, a psychiatric emergency room or a medical emergency room with psychiatric consultation. Or if the person is in any way acting in bizarrely or agitated, um, or I'm gonna say in quotes, threatening, they may end up in the criminal justice system or worse. And so, that's sort of the, 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 the spectrum of, of, of the situation right now. And, and even, if, even if EMS and the police decide to bring someone into healthcare, we need something besides just emergency rooms. We really need that whole spectrum. There are new programs that are developing. Um, in New York in particular, we have a, a pilot program right now where we have a crisis uh, drop-off center diversion program where people can go into a diversion program, get assessed, spend time there, have a medical and psychiatric assessment, um, have, um, get, get a, a social device, uh, get, I'm sorry, get social supports, speak with a social worker <clears throat> as an alternative to an emergency room. But it's just starting off and we're still getting the kinks out. But we need more than just one program like that or two programs like that. We need a spectrum of services. And we also need to help train our first responders, um, whether that be the police or not, whether that be trained uh, folks in behavioral health care, whether that be peers, in addition to EMS, we have to train people to understand what that spectrum is and that they have choices to bring people to other places, other programs besides just emergency rooms. So that's sort of a broad stroke. And that I'm, I'm describing New York, but that's pretty much what exists throughout the country. It's not just in New York. And so, Doctor, if we can back up, though, a little bit and just talk about um, even before someone gets to that point of a crisis, um, you've written about mental health deserts. Mm -hmm. Tell me what you mean by that. And, and, and what about just wanting a therapist, wanting, wanting someone to talk to before it gets to that point? Right. And that's really the focus of prevention. Right? We shouldn't wait until it's an emergency and we're calling 911. We should be intervening with people when they are first getting in a crisis. And as I said, sometimes people just need someone to talk to. They need to know what's out there. They need to know what's available to them. But unfortunately, in, in areas of our country, both urban and rural, there's a shortage of good behavioral health care. And people don't have access. Um, the waiting time to get into an outpatient clinic can be sometimes three to six months. And so if you're having a difficulty, a mental health difficulty, and maybe exacerbated by substance abuse, it's, it's nearly, it, it doesn't even make sense to make people wait three months to get in to see a therapist or a psychiatrist. And by the time they do get in, you've gone from maybe someone having some difficulties to someone who's in crisis, to potentially someone who has an emergency setting. So, so when we talk about these areas where there really is a shortage of behavioral health care, we have to be creative and think about how can we provide different levels of care and systems of care, not just one isolated program, but different levels of care in the community to prevent crisis and prevent emergencies. And so Karis, if you have, um... It, if you're deemed in a crisis, it, tell me who's deeming you to be in a crisis? How does that get defined and who's deciding and, and how are people's, how do people's biases play into those decisions? Um, yeah, thanks for the question. And I think um, first I'd like to say that, you know, we had, um, you know, several people with lived experience throughout the whole um, project and we had a, um, uh, you know, one group that was a standalone so people could feel comfortable and open sharing their personal experiences. So we got to hear from a large group of people around um, 
how they might define, well, what is a crisis? What is a mental health emergency? It's a lot of times the word mental health crisis is used and somehow that um, may uh, to the general public be kind of like, well, that's just one thing, meaning it's the same thing no matter who says it versus kind of what does it mean from the individual? And um, we heard you know, loud and clear from our participants and stakeholders in our um, lived experience group that um, sometimes a mental health crisis isn't a crisis until 911 shows up and then the crisis begins. So um, one of the ways that you know, we talk about, um, and Stephanie, um, Dr. Lamel was kind of getting into this is that sometimes it's the person who needs to define what the crisis is for them. Um, rather than having um, someone else define it or call 911 or call the mobile crisis, what have you, and say, you know, my loved one's in crisis or I'm in crisis, what does that really mean? And so when we break it down and when people were really talking about what was going on with them, it could be anything from, um, you know, in our report and in, the, in one of the groups, young man was talking about having an argument with his sister. And that really kind of set off kind of some anxiety and, and heightened anxiety. And then when, um, uh, you know, assistance was called, that's when things kind of ramped up um, and actually exacerbated everything that was going on versus kind of like slowing things down. So, um, you know, the, that is a question, who gets to decide? Well, the, the person has decided. I don't know if people are really listening to what the person has to say. And that's um, what happens a lot of the time is when we're trying to talk through what's happening with us in the moment where we need some assistance, um, the um, responder may already have front-loaded information around well, the person is agitated or they swung out or they're screaming, they're yelling. So when they come to do the check, it's kind of like they're preloaded with information um, that may um, lend to also exacerbating that situation. And I think um, as, as black and brown folks, um, indeed, um, it feels very different when police come and knock on your door. <laughs> Just be very blunt about it, um, especially if you live like myself. I live in a, you know, uh, at the time that this was happening for me, I lived in an apartment building where I was the only black person in the apartment building. So when the police came and rapped on my door quite loudly saying they were the police, I really didn't want to answer. <laughs> and I was worried about, you know, what kind of perception would people have about me based on stereotypes related to black folks? Um, and so then it just takes on this whole other dynamic of um, a willingness to be involved, figuring out, are you safe? Now, if police are at my door, um, how do I know that I'm safe if things have happened with black folks in the police, even though they're there to do a quote unquote welfare check? So I think these are a lot of things that we, we talked about as uh, folks with lived experience, especially folks who are black and brown and kind of our understanding of what's happening during the crisis, um, who is the responder um, and how do we respond to the responder and how does the responder respond to us? And so Karis, were you talking about a real situation where the police knocked on your door? And, yes. and if so, was it because someone called the police believing that you were in a crisis? Yeah, someone called the police believing I was in a crisis when the police, and I did not know that that's what happened. This is my actual first interaction with having a crisis that was to the extent where I needed um, more support. Um, and I was living by myself, I, you know, wasn't living, you know, with other people, I was just living by myself. And uh, so the, um, uh, you know, when I think, oh, you're having a, a mental health emergency, I think of it as, oh, well, who's going to come to the door? The same people who come if you're having a baby, if you're having a stroke, if you're having, you know, and you're at the mall or you're at your home and you can't get to the hospital, that somebody who is a health professional would come. So it was very shocking to me that outside of my door, people were like, well, this is the, I won't say, I live in Los Angeles. County, so it was somewhere in Los Angeles, um, you know, knocking at the door saying, This is the police, we're here to do a welfare check. Somebody called and said we needed to do a welfare check. That is not what I expected. So it was really scary. Quite frankly, I was scared, I was embarrassed. Um, and I eventually uh, realized I had best open the door because if I don't, they will continue to knock or they will break the door down. So I opened the door and I asked them, I really, I said, you all need to come in my house straight away and keep it down. 
And I'm sure that didn't go over very well, <laughs> but I was really trying to take more control of the situation. And I think that's also what happens in crisis is, um, or when we're kind of um, in this situation where we need more help. As human beings, we all wanna be in control of our own lives. And suddenly you don't have that control and somebody in a uniform is there, I hate to say over you, trying to take control over you. And crisis in everybody's mind is make it stop. And to me, I felt like, look, my complexion has suddenly become somebody's complication. My distress has now become somebody else's kind of like, wow, make that stop. Your distress is disturbing me. And so all of this had to happen very fast to stop. And what um, I needed and what I've heard from our peers who were in the stakeholder groups is things need to slow down. We need to be heard um, and we um, need to gain trust and give trust. And that takes time. It can't happen quickly, unfortunately. Thank you, Karis. And, and Christina, um, Karis just talked about how scary that experience was. And um, you are a peer. Tell, tell us how peers can help with someone like uh, who's experiencing what Karis just described. Um, a peer is somebody who's, who's sort of been down that road before, who's had the experience before. And, and so how can they be a part of this system and, and um, help somebody cope in a moment of crisis? So a lot of oftentimes when peers meet people in crisis, it's not like a five minute conversation or five minutes worth of support. It can take hours and it's a process and it's okay. Peers, we get it. I'm a mental health um, person who lives with bipolar disorder. Um, and I get it and I've had trauma plenty of times in my life. And so when a person's in crisis, I know what recovery, what trauma looks like and what recovery looks like. Um, as a peer, I would approach someone in a non-judgmental way when they're in crisis and actively listen to them because they do have a voice like Kara said, they wanna be heard. We wanna be heard because we're going through a situation and I'm listening to them and validating their experience because there's something in that trauma that they're going through that activated that experience. Um, it's just not like mental health is just not something people just sometimes think that we could just snap out of it. It's not, it's not like that. There's something that triggered and activated us that we're, there's an issue that we need to resolve and we're having a challenge at that moment. And as a peer, you know, as a peer you know, supporting the person, I would try to work and build that rapport and trust so they can alleviate that fear. For instance, um, if I'm approaching someone in an m a home and they're in a crisis, you know, having a wellness check, check, which I don't believe police should be involved. I think a peer like me could be involved. Um, a person's in a corner, they're hysterically crying and I'm trying to like deescalate and offer support. I may look around the room and see like uh, a, 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 a Yankees or some football uh, something. And I may like the same team. I may start talking about it and say like, hey, you know, you like the Nets or you may like this particular team. And then hopefully it may kind of like distract them from what they're going through and maybe start a conversation. Or if I knew like their parent and their mom is like, look, they like vanilla ice cream. And I may say like to them, hey, um, you know, I've been there for a while and I'm trying to get to them. I can't, I may say, you know what? I like vanilla ice cream or do, would you like ice cream? What's your favorite flavor? Or his mom may say, bring him vanilla ice cream. And that may just connect. So my thing is trying to connect, build that trust so they can have, they won't have that fear anymore. They'll feel comfortable with talking to me because they might not be able to talk to the police, which I don't really want them involved. They should not be involved. There should be someone that looks like them that has been through the experience who can help walk them through that situation. Um, and at times it may be appropriate for me to share my story and say, hey, I've been through a similar situation. This is what would happen to me when I was in a crisis. And this is how I got through this. Often enough, when people hear that you've been through it, it gives them hope. And it tells them that the, the next day, there's a better day coming like tomorrow. There was always be a better day tomorrow. So we're giving them hope. So Christina, where, can you just explain at what point in the process would you be called in to, to speak to somebody? This would be where 911 has not been called at all. And, and who would be calling you in? 
Well, right now, 911 is the default call, unfortunately. Um, like in Kara's situation, she had police show up knocking on her door for a wellness check. And a wellness check, police shouldn't be involved. It's like, I, if, if I could show up for, you know, for Karis and, you know, as a peer of support and just introduce myself to her or, and, or to another peer uh, person in the crisis, because peers don't have really autonomy. And when police get involved, they don't have any rights, particularly people of color. Um, people of color, um, people with living with mental illness, it seems like we're just automatically deemed to be dangerous and criminals. I mean, you, you, we often met before us, which isn't right. Um, we should be treated as people. And in the uh, police community, they refer to us as EDPs, emotionally disturbed people. And that's an offensive word. I'm a person. I'm a person that happens to be in crisis, which is fine because anybody could be in crisis. I'm just a person first. I'm never an emotionally disturbed person. I'm a person first. And particularly people in the communities of color, it's like we have this domestic violence relationship with the NYPD or the police department. We have this fear, flight, and fight appease relationship with them. It's, it's dangerous because when police get involved, it just escalates, particularly in the uh, communities of color. So okay. please chief correct. Oh, can I dovetail on Chris, uh, sure. Christina? Because um, I think it depends on where you are. And that's part of what we're getting at, I think, too, with the report is that um, it's almost like crisis response has a level of locality to it as to what services that may be available or that you may have. So for example, there may be um, places in which peers are part of mobile crisis teams and will be um, on the response team to meet someone when a call is made should there be a mobile crisis team and that's the kicker is like is there a mobile crisis team and our peers on them no matter what state or locality you would happen to be in and the answer to that is no but should it be that way yes it yes. should and in new york city we don't have a peer crisis response team we have the heat team as a health engagement assessment team but it's a peer and a social worker but we don't have enough of them okay Thank you, ladies. Um, police Chief Brackney, so you've heard several times here already that the, right now the first response is the police response. So, so tell me what your officers typically find when they respond to a person having a mental health crisis. So to even ask what is a typical response actually fails to understand really the nuance of what we're all grappling with, right? You can't even use the words typical response and we shouldn't be able to use it. That's what's gotten us into this boilerplate where 911 is the, the response. Um, so part of it is, you know, um, is that breakdown right from the very beginning. I think uh, Karis first um, indicated who's defining the crises, right? The crisis should be defined by the person who is um, the person who is in need of mental health support. But here's what's interesting: the crisis is going to be defined by the person who leverages the 911 call. They're going to set the stage almost always for whatever that response is going to be um, of the officer showing up when someone, you know, when they who they called um, around. Um, and Kara, thank you for being vulnerable to talk about your own experience. That is really tough. When someone called that 911 um, dialed 911, they already framed the response for Karis and for the police who were coming. They defined it in such a way that there was some sort of an emergency. Um, the thing about um, the mental health responses is often no one says, hey, 911, when they say, what's your emergency? Someone is having a, um, a mental health um, need and they need support. That's not how the call comes in. It's a disturbance. Someone is yelling, someone is screaming, someone is setting up. We hear breaking of glass. They're setting it up almost as a criminal response right from the beginning. So to have the opportunity, um, as Christina said, to figure out what's going on, the officers are already in hyper vigilant, hyper response mode as to what might be occurring here. Um, and the best way to get us out of that is we need to decouple legislature from police responses. You know, um, Dr. Lamel started out by saying the, the, the laws say you must have a police response. 
until we decouple it, uh, much like Attorney Zimmerman said about you know what was going on at Rikers Island, until you take the government out of making those laws saying who will respond, you're going to continue to get these outcomes that are often fatal um, for people who are black and brown and indigenous who um, are in need of mental health support. Um, so um, there cannot be a typical response because if you get a typical response, we will continue to get the type of outcomes you know, where the statistics right from the beginning said that one in four uh, deaths at the hand of law enforcement also have a person um, who may be experiencing or in need of mental health support. And part of that is even defining crises. We don't have an agreed upon language about crises, emergency, and when it would leverage either police or even a mobile response team. Um, Charlottesville is extremely wealthy, but and we may have resources, but what we're lacking, like every other place that I know, is capacity to do the work. Um, and culturally competent persons um, who are who have the capacity to do the work, including police officers. Um, yes, they may be CIT trained, and that is not a panacea fix all to say the officers need to be CIT trained, but often you find that there's no one in their family who may have had this experience or they're so ashamed to talk about it that they don't bring that experience to work with them um, because it's seen as um, a criminalizing of, um, of mental health and they just don't want to be in that space. So part of us is going to need to reframe our language so that we can reframe our response and reframe what the legislature is doing around these issues because it's legislature who's criminalizing the response and police are part of that enforcement of that criminalization. And so police chief, I'm wondering, you know, a, a lot of the resistance I know here in New York City from the police department is that um, the risk of violence, they, they always talk about um, the risk of violence. And, and so I, I guess in my question, I, I was wondering, um, do police departments try to quantify, look at the 911 calls and try to determine, you know, what percentage of those calls do involve violence? And it's so that so that there could be a better sense of, of, of whether that's legitimate or not. So again, even with the, the analysis, right, no one typically calls in and says this is a mental health crisis or a mental health emergency. It's normally some other event. You know, maybe a family member who's saying um, that they're being violent, right? Um, that it's really hard to do. You can try and trace it on the back end, but you really don't know either because here in Virginia, we have emergency custody orders or temporary detention orders. Those orders may um, have escalated into an emergency custody order or a temporary detention order that wasn't from the, that wasn't from the beginning. Most of the persons, um, if there is violence, we do know this, they're not being violent towards somebody else. It's normally often towards themselves. Um, but it's perceived as being violent to whoever is around them um, as well. So we are doing some analysis here, um, even in Charlottesville on a very local level to see where those persons who are utilizing the system or even being called on more frequently, what does that look like in terms of disrupting that from the beginning, quantifying how often it has resulted um, in violence towards the, um, the community or someone else other than the person who may be experiencing crisis at that moment. But it is really difficult to try and quantify that, that violent um, component. I think that the, the larger is, is fear. And I, I, believe, I can't remember who said it right from the beginning, but you know we often criminalize um, black and brown persons and communities, regardless of what they're experiencing, whether it's poverty, whether it's a mental health, um, a wellness, whether it's educational or um, other areas, we really do have to address the systemic issues of racism in our each of our institutions that have been set up on these supremacist um, institutions before we can, can start to um, really respond healthily and well in communities. Can I just piggyback back off of Chief Brashley for a minute? Sure. Because I think that um, the other aspect of, of asking police to do a, to, to, to 
check on someone who needs health care just doesn't make sense, right? It really doesn't make sense. And, and people, when they're in a crisis, are often afraid. They're afraid for themselves. They're afraid of people around them. They're afraid. And to all of a sudden then have a show of force of police showing up in uniforms just makes people more afraid. So this, the question of violence, I don't even think we can get an accurate measure because I think that just the presence of police in uniforms can sometimes escalate to violence that would not, in, in, you know, in situations that wouldn't normally escalate to violence if there wasn't a police presence. So I think it's even hard to measure that. And more people with mental illness are much more likely to be victims of crime and of, and of uh, you know, um, threats and harassment than they are to perpetrate them. Thank you, doctor. Um, all of you are from different parts of the country. I think it's already been said that depending on where you live, the responses can be different and alternatives can be different. Um, Will Snowden, you are in New Orleans. Uh, tell us what's what's happening in New Orleans right now. There is a federal consent decree, I believe, um, that the city had to abide by to properly offer uh, mental health care in its jail. And their answer was to, to build a new sort of mental health jail. Um, advocates like yourself are opposed. What, what is the alternative to that? What do you believe the alternative to that should be? I think the alternative is, is, is discontinuing the criminalization of mental illness by not trying to have mental health care being led by corrections officials, right? We don't call an electrician when our plumbing goes bad. And so the idea that we are having a, a sheriff or people um, at the jail leading the design and the nature of the care being afforded to people that are brought to the jail, just it, it's the wrong approach. And we think about uh, I think Ken had mentioned this idea of, of a toxic intersection for those that find themselves at this intersection of having serious mental illnesses and being at the intersection with the criminal legal system, we have to figure out a different way of addressing this health problem. And what's frustrating is how the criminal legal system is often a catch basin for the failures of other systems. And if the failure is not if the failure is not properly providing community-based continuum of care, and then those individuals come to the criminal legal system, you're positioning the criminal legal system to try to do something that it's just not positioned to do. So I think the alternative is not, well, the proposal is to spend about $50 million on building, um, uh, a building that's called phase three, it's a facility specifically for people with serious mental illness. I think the alternative is, is figuring out different ways we can use that money. It's actually going to be involved in a long-term solution of providing a continuum of care in New Orleans, it doesn't require somebody to have contact with the criminal legal system to be able to get that care. So I think the alternative lives in the community. It lives in a building or a facility that's designed by doctors, that's run by doctors. And if there needs to be a role for security staff to play, maybe the sheriff can be involved in that nature. But it's just really frustrating from a policy perspective. And we know the phrase, you know, to the person that holds a hammer, everything looks like a nail. That's how we're using the criminal legal system to address the problem of people with serious mental illness that are brought to be in the custody of the sheriff. And what, what kind of support do you have from, from the mayor in New Orleans? The mayor is, um, she, she had, you know, the city attorney's office, the mayor's office has filed motions opposing the construction of phase three. I think for a couple of reasons, one, there was an appreciation that the city of New Orleans would experience about $136 million in lost sales tax revenue as a result of the pandemic. And so knowing that the proposal to build a jail uh, costing $51 million at a time when the city is strapped for cash just doesn't make financial sense. But I do also believe the mayor um, does support the idea of decriminalizing uh, mental illness and the fact of building another facility or building another jail continues the criminalization of mental illness and that's not something that she's in support of. Okay. And so what is your sense? Does this feel like an opportunity to, to really restructure um, and have a continuum of care in New Orleans? I think it's tricky. I think the opportunity is here. I think um, since the jail is under a federal consent decree, the, fr the framework of how we're approaching this conversation is unfortunately guided by um, the, the, the deficient conditions of the jail, right? As opposed to 
identifying the deficient services in the community. And so it certainly is an opportunity. However, the federal judge has been very clear in his appreciation. The city agreed to build a jail uh, in 2017, and he's trying to hold the city to that agreement. Despite the jail having a significantly lower jail population, I want to say in 2017, we had maybe a little more than 1,300 people. Now we have a little under 900. Um, so we're in different circumstances right now. Uh, I think the opportunity is there, but unfortunately, since the conversation is being framed by the federal consent decree, uh, it, it makes the opportunity somewhat constrained. Got it, got it. So Dr. Lamel, let's go back to you. Let's talk about solutions here. In your you know, ideal world, what would, what would a response to a mental health crisis look like? Well, I think, um, as Kira said, I think um, the ideal would be that a person would have some trained clinician and a peer meet with them and assess what their, what their needs are and assess where they're at. And then based on that, they would be triaged to the correct level of care. And that might be a peer-run respite program. It might be uh, a respite program that has some medical facilities where they can get psychiatric care and met and um, substance abuse treatment and other social supports. It might be like a day hospital um, level of care where someone could go and actually spend time in sort of more intensive treatment for a period of time. Um, and in some cases, people might need might be in a true an emergency and need to go to an emergency room, um, and then from there get triaged to the proper inpatient setting, whether that be an inpatient setting where they can have both substance abuse and mental health treatment, or whether it would be um, purely mental health treatment or purely uh, uh, substance abuse treatment or combination and medical care. Because oftentimes it can be medical exacerbations that are causing people to have a crisis in addition to mental health and substance related crises. And sometimes it's totally social. And as I was saying before, and I think as everybody has mentioned, Sometimes just having someone hear you and listen, just talking to someone can de-escalate a crisis and, and doing preventive care in the treatment programs that currently exist in the community. I think one of the problems we have right now is because of the way behavioral health care is reimbursed, there, people have to sort of meet a quota to keep the doors open and pay their staff. So we don't have the time often to have walk-ins or to have people in early stages of crisis be able to get to their providers right away. There are ways to fix that. There are ways to sort of manage and design outpatient behavioral health care to allow for redundancy so that you can, so that there is no wrong door, that people can show up whenever, even if they don't have an appointment and get to see their clinicians who can help de-escalate or come up with a plan or to help people just think through what they need to do next. So in the, in the ideal, we need to improve our systems of care. We need a spectrum of systems of care both in the preventive area in the community and also in terms of the crisis spectrum. And we need to train our clinicians to be able to triage um, and really understand what level of care a person needs. But to do that, you have to sit with the person. You have to listen to the person. You have to hear what their story is and then help them to decide what level of care really suits their needs. That said, there are times when people's um, emotional state is such that they're not able to make those sorts of decisions for themselves. And in, in those cases, I think that helping people to get the level of a higher level of care that they need in the most humane way possible is really what we have to do. And that's often where an emergency room and an inpatient um, unit, inpatient psychiatric unit um, come into play. But that's not, that shouldn't be the only choice. There really need to be other choices and we can do it. Um, we know how to do it. We just need the, the, the infrastructure, the systems change and the funding changes to make that happen. And, and, and with Cindy, some... I was gonna say, can I jump in there first? Sure. When you talk about a system of care, the thing we were neglecting is who leverages that system of care, right? So Dr. Lamel, is, it, it's great that this is what we would do, but that first call is coming to 911. Even if you create another system, um, you know, we're going to the, the national systems for the suicide hotline. It has to be who's taking that very first call. 
and how are they trained and what are those checklists and how do they triage that so that they then can you know divert someone authentically divert them from the criminal legal system right you I, know I, and for the 911 call Right. I was, yeah, I was talking about preventive care in the communities and the spectrum of services that we need yes. to have. But I agree that nine if the 911 call stays the way it is now, it's not gonna work. We have to we have to we have to disaggregate the police and, and, and the police response to a healthcare need. And and I think that with nine eight eight, if it's done right, and it can be, if it's done right and if it's if there's enough both federal investment and state and local investment in, in properly setting this up, because you're right, referral to what? And who's making that decision? We right. have to have people answering those phones who are trained in these decision trees, in these triage decision trees. And then we have to have community organizations that are receptive to receiving people from those services and take them in. And crises don't just happen from nine to five. They happen all around the clock. So we have to set right. up the systems to fit those types of needs. Right. And, and that's going to be the key. You just can't have the next set of dispatchers look like the dispatchers who Absolutely. currently sit in the, the systems now where we say, who, what is your emergency, right? Mm -hmm. It has to be a very different, um, or if that doesn't occur, if they do dial 911, how do you in, then ensure that you're getting that same level of service and care by the person who's answering that phone. So being able to train up or scale up to ask very different questions um, than they currently ask. Right, and at each there, point, we have to train people appropriately. Is there a model right now that exists for a good uh, 911 or 988 uh, dispatch training guide? So currently, uh, you know, you'll hear people talk about CAHOOTS, which is the one or the um, right care out of Dallas. Fairfax has one called Diversion First um, that is out, but these are really heavily funded, you know, thousand person operations that most small um, rural communities can't afford to support. There are some some really strong ones that are out there, but they tend to be in very large cities who have a lot of money and they've been developing these for years. They're not someone who's just trying to start up as we speak. You'll find that they've been doing these for a decade or, you know, five, seven years long enough to have some studies behind them. Um, as most people are now trying to scale up, recognizing the genuine authentic emergency or crises that we find ourselves in. Right. And so someone is posting Houston, Texas, which um, I know does have um, a program in which they are diverting calls away from the police. But as you were saying, police chief, it, it's taken years to be able to do that. And it takes years for the police to trust that those calls can be diverted safely without anyone being harmed. Um, is there is is there a faster way to, to build that trust? Well, I think there's one piece missing in the conversation, and that is what about the person served, and what role do they have? They're not a, they're not passive in this whole thing, and they shouldn't be. And I think that's the power of um, what peers can do and helping people uh, to develop psychiatric advance directives to use wellness recovery action plans where when you're well, you can start to think about, wow, you know, what are some things that number one, um, I do to stay well? Um, who are my supporters? Uh, who would I like to have information um, so that, and what information so that they can support me when maybe things aren't going so well? And what would I like them to do? Um, should things kind of look like this a b c d e and then your supporter actually would know what to do and then um, the psychiatric advance directive also just like a health advance directive helps the uh, treatment team if you will um, kind of have a better sense of okay this is the person's preferences, you know, what medications work for them, what social supports, they have to go into hospital or in hospital, they like to have their teddy bear, best have their teddy bear so we don't have kind of things going on, just about a teddy bear, right? So it's all written down um, and a psychiatric advance directive is a legal document. Um, some states do have um, legislation or regulations 
regulations around psychiatric advanced directives, some do not. So I think that's one thing to start to um, empower people and so that their choices and preferences um, are adhered to, which then develops more trust and ability to participate in um, the treatment and supports because you're sharing in that, it's yours versus somebody imposing it on you. So um, there are some systems that have looked at um, ensuring that the police know what um, psychiatric advanced directives are and ask for them. Do you have a psychi advanced, a psychiatric advanced directive? Do you have a wellness recovery action plan? The RAP is not legally binding per se, but it does give um, whoever is that responder a place to start with the conversation to meet the person where they are and to give them that power that may, they may feel at the time is being taken away, if you will. So those are some other powerful things that become a part of the system. And then I also think when we're looking at um, other models in other states. Um, so for example, CAHOOTS is one and there's you know, a legislative bill around CAHOOTS right now too, not, not its particular model, but looking at crisis response that um, CAHOOTS is um, built on one agency for, for Eugene and um, having all of the things come in and out of this one agency. And so the question then becomes, how do you take that great model and make sure it's connected to all of the things that might be in the community that might support people? Um, sometimes I think the belief is that um, to support people and what they need, um, it's all going to happen maybe within the mental health system of care, but some of it actually may happen right in the community. It may be around some of these connections that they need to meaning and purpose in life. So doing things like supported employment or supported education, which is an evidence-based practice to support the person having that meaning and purpose relative to their life, not relative to their illness. So we have to balance sort of this helping in the recovery from, from the illness and making sure that also people have that uh, uh, keep connected to meaning and purpose in life through those um, supports as well. And lastly, to, to Will's point about, you know, sorry about the, the jail situation in, um, in uh, New Orleans, but one of the things that was really interesting in um, uh, uh, the development of a, not a new jail, but re redesigning a jail is that for the women's prison, it was totally built wrong for, for women with mental health conditions and was causing um, trauma, more trauma, because there wasn't an open area for women to be. Um, and so when they were, um, uh, sent back to their cells and some of them had to be five point restraint for certain reasons. It brought up all sorts of trauma for them, especially sexual trauma or violence kind of things. So they really had to rethink how are they going to, um, uh, and again, it's, this is not where we want people to be. So let's just be clear about that. But I, but I think again, if, if we're talking about building anything, whether it be um, you know, a mental health center, a peer center, a community center, it's how do the people who are going to be in that center day after day, how do they want to see it? So it um, really um, marries up with um, um, having feeling um, um, that there's dignity, respect, um, that it is a place where they want to be, not have to be, um, so that uh, they can uh, also participate um, in, in, in treatment and supports. Can I chime in on the race equity piece real quick? Um, sure. When we think about race equity, at least when I say that, I often think about how race should no longer be a predictor in outcome in the system. And we know that uh, at least in the New Orleans jail, well, let me back up a little bit. The Racial Equity Institute uses this analogy that I, I like to share, you know, they, they say, imagine you're driving past a lake and you see a fish dead belly up in the lake. You might think what's wrong with the fish. Well, let's say the next day you drive past that lake and you see a hundred fish belly up in the lake dead. You might begin to ask yourself what's wrong with the water. And so this groundwater approach of understanding what is the systemic contribution to the problems that we're seeing needs to be part of the conversation. And we look at the New Orleans jail 75% of the people in the, more than 75% of the people in the jail are on psychotropic medications. And then more than 90% of the people in the jail are black men. And so we can't just talk about the individual. We have to talk about the system that's, are, that's creating these inequities and these disparities in the first place. And with this report, you know, it underscores that racial equity doesn't just happen without intention, right? As communities shift away from the conversation of police led responses to people in behavioral crisis, we must be proactive in addressing these racial disparities that we know are present 
in all of these different systems. And as I said before, the criminal legal system is often positioned as being the catch basin of the other failed systems, but also how those disparities get fed into the criminal legal system can't be replicated. And so when we're having conversations about alternative responses, about diverting calls from police, there's many different discretionary points along that line. And so we wanna make sure that we're incorporating the conscious decisions of how race equity needs to be advanced and all those different discretion points along the way so that we're not exacerbating the disparities that are being fed into the system, and we're actually using those opportunities to reduce them. You know, just to piggyback off of what Kiris and Will are both saying, part of that is about how we train people, right? It's about how we train our clinicians and the decision makers along all of these points in the spectrum. And I think that unfortunately, we tend to stick with a medical model where we're trying to treat, you know, symptoms of illness, and we're not thinking about the whole person. And I think Kira sort of brought this up that, that we have to train our clinicians to step out of the medical model sometimes, not to ignore it entirely, but to step out of it and think more holistically about um, what's going on in someone's life and what's wrong with the system, as Will's saying, what's wrong with the water? Our systems need to change. And for our systems to change, we, the providers of services in these systems, have to change the way we think. So we have to train our providers differently. We have to train them to see people through a recovery lens and, and a, and a person-centered, empowered way and help people reach their goals. And that our job is to help people get to those goals, not tell them what to do, but join with them in getting to their goals. We have to take a systems-based practice approach, looking at our systems that currently exist and figure out how do we make this better? How do we make this actually fit the population that we're trying to treat needs as opposed to trying to make people fit into our nine to five? How do we change our systems around? And then the third lens is really a social justice lens. And to Will's point that so many people that, that are getting care in the public systems of care are poor people and they tend to be brown and black and indigenous people and they have the bias and stigma of our country um, and racism, in addition to the bias and stigma of mental illness and substance abuse. And we label them as bad people if they don't fit well into our systems, but our systems really need to change to fit with what people need. And so you were asking Ms. Rodriguez about hopefulness and about the future. I think we can do this. I think if we train our clinicians to think more broadly about their roles in this, I think if we incorporate peers um, into our service plans and into our programs and pay them well for the job that they do and not marginalize them, um, you know, doing scout work that, that other people don't want to do, but really truly valuing their, their contribution to the team, as well as the social workers and family members and other community members who really help people to stay well and not focus just on treating symptoms, but actually helping people to stay well. Can I say something? You finished? Okay. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, so I do agree with you that um, like we need to work on changing a lot of things in the medical model because it's not like person-centered. And in the peer community, we always say there's nothing about us without us. It's important that peers, I mean, like peers, we navigate through broken systems daily, whether it's in healthcare, housing, criminal justice, and so forth. But so when it comes to like policies and programs, peers should be at the be part of the conversation and the decision-making process. We need to be involved in the planning, design and implementation process because we know what's best for us. Um, because others, like a lot of people are not culturally conscious, conscious and they, fit, they feel that we don't fit into the societal norms and that we are the issue. We're not the issue. It's the, it's the program, it's the broken system that's the issue. Um, I have a, a personal situation where I first got diagnosed um, years ago when I was uh, experiencing like discrimination in a white work, white male workforce. And I went to end up in a hospital because it was too much pressure. And so my white male psychiatrist at the hospital, I was sharing with him that I'm being discriminated against. This is going on, this is going on. And he just looked at me like I was just like, oh, she's delusional, she's this. And he brought in students in the room with him to observe my behavior. And I'm sitting there crying because I'm afraid all this, I'm overwhelmed. And they're looking at me that there's something wrong with me. It's not like basically what happened. It should have been like, oh my God, what happened? How can we support you? No, it was like, what's wrong with you? Let me take out my book because we're here to diagnose you. And so to me, it's like doctors are there for just like, Diagnose, diagnose, medication, and stabilization. It wasn't about me at all. Um, so, and then he diagnosed me with schizophrenia, 
which was I was misdiagnosed because he didn't wanna hear my complaints of being discriminated by white men in the workforce. Um, he didn't validate my experience. All he did was over medicate me and with drugs that gave me temporary uh, paralysis. It was more like a punitive treatment um, to me. And so that's why I think it's so important that we need peers in the, this recovery, not recovery, but in the, uh, the first response process, because it's like, we get it. We treat people like people. It's like a holistic approach. We listen to them. We listen to the needs of our, our, our people in our community. And we're like, oh, you know, I see the, the frustration and emotions is coming from they have the lack of housing or they didn't get the proper health care or they lost their child in family court. It's a lot of issues and pressures that people go through day to day. If we can help fill those voids, people won't be in crisis. And my second point is like we were talking about, um, Cindy, you requested, uh, asked some information about care responses and uh, um, that's positive care responses that we have, um, care responses. Besides cahoots, we have like the star supported, it's called support teams assisted response in Colorado, Denver. And it was, um, it started in June, 2020. And within the first six months of that program, um, there was 750 calls for mental health calls and there was no police involved, no arrests and no jails. There are several um, care responses going on throughout the country in Canada and the United Kingdom. And a lot of them are actually considering having peers more involved. We're trying all over the country to pass legislation where peers would be like first responders. Unfortunately, a lot of the call, um, police are still involved and a lot of the phone numbers are still going directly to 911. And we need, we don't, we need an alternative number like 988 or some other number so people can be um, directed towards mental health care, not through the police system. Christina, thank you so much for, for sharing your, your personal story. Um, I have gone over, I did a terrible job of keeping track of time, but I was, Hoping maybe we could squeeze in one question. Um, I am going to ask the organizers how they feel about that. And I believe Adam maybe was going to be the one to read a question or two. Of course. Your first question is, where do we start in regards to advocating for peer response teams in our state? Uh, I guess that would depend on, on which date, but, but, uh, but Karis or Christina, do either of you want to take that? Yeah, sure. So I think there are several places you could start. Um, I know that, um, and, and Christina, I'll let you talk about Fountain House and Care Responders <laughs> Advocacy, yay. Um, and then um, also um, in at the state level, um, MHAs and NAMIs um, are involved in 988, um, the 988 legislation. So the 988 is the number that people are supposed to call if somebody is um, um, uh, suicidal or having a mental health crisis in lieu of 911. And it is not supposed to be just a number, it is supposed to also be a response system. So many of the states that are doing legislation do have um, uh, uh, teams working on this legislation that it include both NAMI, MHA, and the National Association of Peer Supporters is also uh, helping with that legislation. So you can contact any of them to find out uh, more information about how to be involved. Uh, quickly, in New York City, Fountain House is a member of Correct Crisis Intervention Today. It's www.ccitnyc, which I, oh, I'll put into the chat box. We're a coalition of about 80 people who are advocating for non-police response to mental health calls. We've been doing it for about uh, seven years now. And we're looking and recruiting for more uh, st steering committee members, particularly people with lived experience would be helpful because we need to share and tell our elected officials that we need to be at the table because our voices matter and we want systems to change so we can have better outcomes for ourselves. All right, thank you ladies. So sorry everybody that we didn't get in more questions. Hopefully we covered a lot of ground and hopefully we, we answered a lot of your questions in the discussion. Um, thank you everyone. Thank you to all the panelists um, for all of your input. And um, I will turn it over to Dr. Bassan. Thank you, Christine. Uh, thank you, Cindy. And thank you to the panelists. Um, you know, it was such a rich discussion. And thank you for the attendees as well, participants for your patience. I know these 
these late night Zoom calls are, are taxing. Uh, I just want to piggyback on something Christina said and mentioned about CCIT, where Fountain House is actually leading um, the beginnings of a movement to call a member-led movement, a person-led movement, a peer-led movement in three states, in two states and three cities across the country in, during, under a campaign called Care Responders, which you can find at our website, www.fountainhouse.org. And we, we see the same things you all see, which is that people with lived experience of mental illness need to be centered in the design of the system and when organized can actually create a power base for change. So, so uh, check it out and get involved. And, and I think that's a good segue for my last remarks, which is just to say, thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for engaging on this issue. You know, we hope you'll look at the report, but more importantly, you'll hope you look at the report and then use it in your local communities. I think Kara said something that I just want to drive home. This is both a national crisis, a national epidemic, but also a very local solution set at times. And so wherever you are, wherever you're dialing in from, make sure you know what's going on in your community, get involved and use something like this, this toolkit as a way to start that conversation in your community or piggyback on conversations that are already happening. Um, I want to also just reflect on something Will said, and I think the fish analogy is, is pretty remarkable, and I might use that and steal that, Will. So, um, <laughs> But this is about, yes, this is about the redesign of services in the immediate, but as we are talking about in the report, this is about a public health mindset, whereas you address upstream factors that actually reduce the number of people in crisis as defined by the person, right? as defined by the person, not by systems that artificially create a definition of crisis. And I think we've already proven that a lot of our systems are poorly designed and have poor diagnostic capability to actually look at what's risk, safety, and as such. So I think it's time we put some of that power and that decision-making authority back in the hands of people who are affected. Um, and so I wanna just pick on what Will said and say, we need to move further upstream the mental health crisis we're facing in COVID is in part a man-made crisis as well, right? It's not just an individual brain or biological issue. There are man-made factors that traumatize people, that marginalize people, that um, all you have to do is look at the results of the Stockton UBI study that showed that small cash payments improved mental health scores, improved well-being in Stockton, California. And so this is, we have, we have some part of this crisis that's under our control and we need to use our policy, our advocacy and our collective strength to start to address that crisis. And then lastly, I'll just say, we actually have a huge opportunity. I wanna reflect, end with what Ken was saying here. You know, the fact that you're all here listening to this, the fact that we're talking about this issue both narrowly in terms of mental health crisis, but also how crisis leads to this bigger conversation about our overall mental health system and the drivers of mental health crises means that we are at a moment where we can actually situate this conversation in our public life, where we as a collective can galvanize solutions. And so please get engaged, stay engaged. And really, you know, only together are we gonna take advantage of this opportunity. Mental health has been a system that's been starved, absolutely starved of resources, of people, and yet we, you know, we can start to bring together our collective talent and leadership to actually start to make a change. So um, thank you for being with us. Thank you for being with Fountain House. Thank you for, with being, being, for being with all of our partners tonight. And uh, thank you to all the panelists and the attendees. Um, wishing you well. Good night.